let the church say amen. Yes. I have a problem when I hear beautiful singing like that. I don't mind people singing well, I just wish they didn't make it look so effortless. And the problem that I have when I hear someone singing so beautifully as Nikki just did is, I become deluded into thinking that I can sing. That, 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 that's really, really bad. And, I, and I, I start saying, if I had that kind of backup, yeah, give me a little company. I want Jesus. If I, I could, I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus. But, but it doesn't happen that way. But anyway, you, 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 get, you get the point. Praise the Lord. All right. I did that for Lewis. He told me to do it. Praise God. I want to thank Cheryl for her wonderful introduction. And I rather suspect that Cheryl can preach. Do you see how smooth she is? I mean, under the radar, wonderful, like a stealth bomber against the kingdom of darkness. Uh, what a marvelous uh, communicator. When there are long introductions like the one that I receive, people try to guess my age, okay? And let me tell you, don't believe everything you see on Google. Don't believe it, okay? Well, a lady stopped me and she said, how old are you, Chaplain Black? I said, madam, I'm a retired admiral. That information is classified. <laughs> I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you after I told you. She said, oh, chaplain, don't joke with me. You, you just tell me a little bit about your background and I can tell you how old you are. I said, well, I was a missionary to South America. She started scribbling immediately. I, she must be an accountant. She said, um, I pastored 11 churches in North and South Carolina, I was writing. Um, I was a Navy chaplain for 27 years. Uh, I have been in the Senate for 15 years. I bet that stop. I, I've got it. I've got it. You're 89 years old. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All righty. So I want to thank you for inviting this octogenarian <laughs> to be here and share in this, uh, this wonderful program. Now, I know none of you sanctified Spirit-filled Seventh-day Adventists, none of you could possibly know where I got my title from. Show me the money, <laughs> Pastor. Okay, well, it is actually from the New Testament. <laughs> and Jerry Maguire, but it is actually from the New Testament. Two great lines in that movie that none of you have ever seen. I did not see it until it came out on DVD. But anyhow, we, we're not going there. We're not going there. Okay. Uh, coming up, of course, we were not, we, we were not permitted to, to um, go to the movies. You young people don't know anything about that, but we were not permitted to go to the movies. And so we did more to decrease the membership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church when I was coming up there, because our friends would say, okay, you gonna go to the movies? And we would get this, not Adventist, but sad Venice look on our face. <laughs> My mama won't let me go to the movie, you know, so you know, we, we really did, you know. Well, have a ham sandwich, we can't eat that either. So it was really rough, anyway. <laughs> but confession is good for the soul, and with this beautiful, I tell you, I love this of our blessed Lord. You guys have it going on. This, this is absolutely amazing. In most Adventist churches that I visit, there's, there, there are the Ten Commandments about that size behind me. So thank you. Thank you for this. This is what it's all about. Our Savior and our King who can save from the guttermost to the uttermost and who's whose last prayer, that intercessory prayer in John chapter 17, declared Father, could have asked for anything. He said, Father, make them vegetarians. As, no, <laughs> is that what it says in the Greek? No, no, no. He says, Father, make them one. Could have made any request. I want them to be one. And then the book of Revelation says when, uh, when, when, when our Lord comes and we're on our way to heaven, there will be a multitude which no one can number. Wow. I, I'm already a part of that multitude, and you may not know it, but you're already a part of that multitude. Our blessed Lord said, no one will be able to snatch you out of my hands. Amen. Thank you. Okay. 
he, he said, no one will be able to snatch you out of my hands. Praise God. And we will see a multitude that looks like this from every nation, kindred, tribe, and people. So if you don't like diversity, you're not going to like heaven. Praise <laughs> God from whom all blessings flow. Huh. When I was coming in, uh, as soon as I got up front, a gentleman came to me and said, Siegfried Neuendorf said hello. And my mind went back to a, to a time in my life when I became an atheist. Okay? And it was not something that I expected to happen. It was like someone flipping a switch and the light of agnosticism and atheism came on. I grew up in this church. Christian education, the harmonious development of the physical, mental, spiritual, and social powers, okay? You know? I speak Ellen White without an accent. That's how good I am, okay? <laughs> right? Right? And so that, that's all I knew. And yet the irony, listen to me, the irony is I never shook hands with someone who didn't look like me until I was 16 years old. Now this was not South Africa. I, I, I never saw a non-African American preacher in my church. I never had a meal with a non-African American and I, I did not shake hands and the only reason why I shook hands was because I shook hands with the second place winner of the temperance oratorical contest sharing my sincere condolences to him that he had not, you know, modesty will not permit me to take, but anyhow. <laughs> and then I didn't shake hands again until I went to Andrews. Eh? Come on now. Eh? But this was the church I loved and I grew up in and it nurtured me and I don't know where I would be without this amazing truth, okay? You know? I tried to eat, I, I did not succeed, Lewis. I tried to eat some Kentucky Fried Chicken when I was 27 years old. I went in, it took me 30 minutes to order the meal. They thought I was mentally challenged, you know. The, I could not make up whether it was gonna be extra crispy. I figured if it's extra crispy, it would not look like a chicken. <laughs> My mom had us brainwashed I just thought, and I was hungry. I hadn't eaten for hours, I mean, for almost a day. And so here I was looking at this extra crispy, and it still looked like a dead chicken. <laughs> and I threw it in the trash can. Imagine that. I'm going to get to heaven, and I missed my opportunity to taste some chicken. <laughs> Couldn't do it. Could, that's how, how much. But... When I got to Huntsville, Alabama, early 60s, Brown v. The Board, most of you know, had already been implemented. But the Supreme Court had said, with all deliberate speed, you implement this. And in Alabama, it meant, until the 12th of never. <laughs> and that's a long, long time. Yeah. This is my best Johnny Mathis, but anyway. So we decided to go to my church, my Sabbath-keeping church, my church with the big Ten Commandments behind us, the law of the living God. And when we got there, the church members obeying the law, they were legal, obeying the law, said, Big deacon, about six five, said, you know, I think you all would be happier worshiping with the coloreds. No, this is fine. We praise the Lord. Happy, happy. You know, uh, uh, that was not a suggestion. And someone flipped a switch. And all of that Christian education went out of the window. I was an atheist. I was not only a man without a God, I was a man without a country. 
I said, if the Supreme Court could delay the implementation of a law they said was not right, Plessy v. Ferguson, separate but equal, changed by Brown v. the board, and this, they can play these games, I don't have a country and I don't have a God. And my atheism began to show how in my freshman year, when you, when you did something that you shouldn't do as a student, you went to the dean of students. In my freshman year, I went to the dean of students 11 times. I mean, I don't know what, how I even st stayed there. I, I was not expelled. And then someone said, we need a student missionary. I'm getting to seek Fleet Neuendorf. I haven't forgotten him. We need a student missionary. And they said, well, is it going to be a dangerous project? Yes, the jungles of Peru. Alligators, crocodiles, mountain lions. And I believe the faculty got together and said, do we have an expendable student? Is, is there, <laughs> is there, I mean, you know, I mean, this is dangerous. We don't, you know, who, which student would, if we lost him, we, praise and God, we pray God this will not happen, but which of these 1,500 students, if that person was lost, would have the least negative impact on the campus? So I know that already, Barry Black. Yeah, from Baltimore, Maryland. You know, the one that Cheryl just introduced. That the one. So it, it, it doesn't say anything about me that I'm the first student missionary from Oakwood College. I'm like the, the people on Star Trek. You know if you go down with Kirk, you, you, you're not coming back. You're one of those expendable people on, when they say beam me up, Scotty, you've already had, they, they send him off to South America. We don't know where it is, but send him off anyhow. Praise the Lord. Tell you. And I hit the ground when I saw my first alligator, my Spanish, but I said, Padre nuestro que estás en los cielos, santo pecado, sea tu nombre. And that was Siegfried. Siegfried, tall. He was so tall, the natives called him Masayal del Sol. <laughs> Far beyond the sun. And, and, and I stop listening to Martin, and I, I spew. I, I, it was horrible how I treated. Siegfried was German. Neuendorf, yeah. Blonde hair, piercing blue eyes, and as a, as a youth, <laughs> was a member of Hitler's youth squad. And you're sending me to Siegfried Neuendorf? You know, right? And he and his precious Canadian wife, Evelyn, broke me with love. They broke me. I, I said, you're killing me. <laughs> you know? No matter what I say, no matter how angry I am, no matter how twisted my logic may be, why do you keep loving me? Why don't you push back? And if you go to my man cave, every man needs a man cave. You'll see pictures of Evelyn and Siegfried all around because they showed me the money. They showed me the currency of true Christianity. Their love for this holy incarnate deity made me love him also. And when I went back to Oakwood University, I said, if there are people like this, I need to begin to pursue the ministry. Amen. Show me the money. Mark's Gospel, chapter 12. Some people come to Jesus around verse 13. Hint, 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 hint. Thank you. Wow, this is good. I need to preach him up. <laughs> Later they sent some of the Pharisees and the Rhodians to Jesus to catch him in his word. Okay, these are religious people trying to trap our blessed Lord. They came to him and said, teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. Watch out when people flatter you. 
Oh, Admiral, this is a, you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Oh, you're so wonderful. But, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And just, just, we're just a little confused, just a little bit. They, they, they sought to place him on the horns of an impossible dilemma. Is it right to pay imperial taxes to Caesar or not? If he says yes, and they've studied the strategy, their syllogistic reasoning is impeccable. If he says yes, they go to the people and say, see, he is permitting this dominant power, the ones who can force us to go a mile when, we, when we're tired and coming back from Wednesday night prayer. No, 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 no. He, 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 he's supporting this dominant power. Yeah, yeah. But if he says, no, don't pay taxes, they'll run to the Roman authorities and say to them, this man is a seditionist. You need to do something. He's telling us not to pay taxes. We got him. There's no way in the world he can get away with this. But Jesus was so cool. Praise God. He said, show me the money. <laughs> they brought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar, they reply. Then Jesus said to them, and this is so critical, this is the principle, because many times, beloved, <laughs> we don't, as people of faith, obey this. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Now, let's turn to Romans 13 and find out what belongs to Caesar and what belongs to God. I tell you, these audiovisual people deserve a, uh, if, if they get it out in the next two seconds, this is, this will be, they're, they're, I started to say they deserve a raise, but you know, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy, it says, I can help you if you do, I can come back there now, okay. Uh, what is our relationship to government? That is something to ask on a day like this. Because if we'd answered that correctly, there it is. Yeah. You, you, in a great heart, you, you can stall for time so well. There, there you go, okay. Now check this out, because this is amazing. And this lets us know how we should relate to government and what the currency of our spirituality should look like. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no uh -oh, authority except that Lord help us, which God has established. Okay. I just came back from preaching in St. Louis and people were saying 45, 45, 45. And I didn't know what they meant. The ministers were saying 45. And I said, Why, what is 45? I don't understand. I, I know there's a 45 caliber pistol. And they said, it refers to the one who must not be named. You'll get that on the way home. But anyway, and I'm not talking Harry Potter. They're talking about the head of the executive branch of our government, 45. And one minister says, I, since November, I have not called this person by name, only by a number. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is, Lord help us, rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. You, you owe a debt to government. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. Now let me pause here and say, beloved, if you're going to show the currency of true Christian spirituality, you must remember that government is ordained by God. And that governmental officials are ordained by God. And in Daniel chapter 2, God even knows the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. He knows the sequence of the powers, the governmental power. You are the head of gold, he said to Nebuchadnezzar. After you will come another, the Medo-Persian Empire, we know that, and the Greeks. And all. He knows. He knows what is going to happen to our planet 
past, present, future, at a glance, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So we need to remember to respect government. I, very interesting because I, I had to, I was preaching in Philadelphia and uh, they had a Q&A afterwards and they set me up for the Q&A. There were about six or 700 people and the moderator said, before Dr. Black, when they set you up, they always call you doctor. Before Dr. Black, answers your questions. I have a question to ask to the audience. And he said, how many of you believe that God placed Donald Trump in the White House? And this was six, 700 people. Two hands went up. Out of six to 700 people, two hands went up. Remember, if you're gonna show the currency of true spirituality, re remember that governments are ordained by God. Eh? And so I was not gonna, I was not gonna field questions with a setup like that. I said, well, before I field your questions, let me ask you a question. I knew they were biblically literate. They were Seventh-day Adventists, okay? I said, how many of you believe that God placed Nebuchadnezzar in power? I knew they knew Daniel chapter one, verse one, and God delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, good guy, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Okay, you look in a biblical dictionary under crazy, you will see a picture of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was crazy, okay? I mean, anybody who says heat the furnace seven times hotter than it, you know, I mean, make their homes and dung hills, kill them all, kill them all, because I can't remember, he was crazy. I'm sorry, he was crazy. I have to remember, Lewis. I, I, I have to remember, I pray for me, Lewis, I'm, I'm trying to represent you well. Lewis is so dignified, see? He's been working on me. That's why I started wearing bow ties. But I'm trying to, okay, but then, right? So I said to the good Sabbath keeper, how many of you believe, you know, and, and they knew, and hands started creeping up reluctantly. I said, now, you mean to tell me you believe that God put Neb, fiery furnace, Kaneza, in the power, and you get, I said, now I'm ready to field your questions, and a whole lot of questions change. You gotta know how to do that. So remember, government is ordained by God. For the one in authority is God's servants, for your good, that's right. But if you do wrong, be afraid of the rulers, do not, the, be afraid, for the rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are what? God's servants agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So first thing, if you're going to do, show the currency, show me the money of true Christian spirituality. Remember that governments are ordained by God. Secondly, be grateful for the blessings and opportunities provided by government, okay? I don't know about you, but LBJ's Great Society got me through Oakwood University and Andrew. I mean, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm grateful, okay? Think of what Egypt would have been like without Joseph and government set aside to 20%. It became a breadbasket to the world. We would be speaking German or Japanese today without government. I mean, that would be our native tongue, you know? We would not have gotten through World War II without government. Think of England and what government and great leadership. I believe God raises up people at the right time. When, when the Luftwaffe was bombing London back into the Stone Age, here comes this bulldog determined, you know, you know, and so let us brace ourselves for duty and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire should last a thousand years, men will say, this was their finest hour. I have nothing to offer you but blood, tears, toil, and sweat. I mean, who, who, who talks like that when it's obvious that you're going to be defeated, you would seem, and then when, what would we have done without government with the right lead? December 7th, 1941, 
a date that will live in infamy. And then that peroration, the American people in their righteous might will throw off this tyranny, so help us God. The blessings of government, the opportunities of government. My house caught on fire in Virginia Beach. We didn't get on our knees and pray. We called the fire department and government brought to put out the flames. Be grateful for, for the blessings and the opportunities provided by government. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities. See that seamless transition there? You take notes, Lewis, take notes. It, submit to the authorities not only because of the possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Huh. Now here we get to the sticky part. This is also... <clears throat> I don't like this verse very much, but here it is. This is also why you pay taxes. The devil is a liar. No, this is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants. Well, well I'm being paid. I'm the chaplain of the center who give their full time to governing. That's right. Pay your taxes. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, if respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Hey, beloved, we've got to show respect and honor to the position. Okay? When Douglas MacArthur was late, and Harry Truman had flown over the pond to see. <laughs> General Douglas MacArthur, you know, and Arthur was smooth and, you know, Truman was a failed haberdasher and here, you know, MacArthur was eloquent. Old soldiers never die. They simply fade away. I mean, he was even duty, honor, courage. I wish I had the poetry of imagination, the brilliance of metaphor. That, I mean, he, was, he was smooth. He shows up late. Harry Truman, Truman fired him. Congress pushed back, gave MacArthur an opportunity to speak to a joint session of Congress. Truman said, I don't care what he feels about Harry S. Truman, I'm, no, I'm a nobody. But he will not disrespect the commander in chief of the armed forces of the United States of America. Honor, to whom honor is due. But what happens, back to show me the money, when Caesar and Christ collide, when Caesar and God, when they collide, we ought to obey God rather than humanity. I went back to Oakwood Moved by the love, the hospitality, the spirituality of Siegfried and Evelyn. And a diminutive preacher, 5758 five, Martin King, used to come to Oakwood's campus because they had the largest uh, auditorium in Huntsville at the time. And he was talking about desegregating. We shall overcome, he said, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We shall overcome because Carlisle is right. No lie can live forever. We shall overcome because William Cullen Bryant is right. Truth crushed to earth. A Baptist preacher. I was going to, uh, well, can we participate in the desegregation? They're desegregating the lunch counters at Woolworth. Well, uh, the Bible says, occupy until I come. Barry, it won't be long. I can hear a rushing mighty wind. Our blessed Lord is soon to come. Uh, you you, you, let, you let them take care of that. We shall overcome because the Bible is right. You shall reap what you sow. And deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall, in other words, the boundary, 
The law is not right. We used to carry signs, I am a man. It is unbiblical for you to treat people like that. And so let us rise from the fatigue of despair to the buoyancy of hope. This will be a great America. We will be the participants in making it so. And so we desegregated lunch counters. Young people, you know, Rebecca, we went against our elders and desegregated the lunch counters of Huntsville, Alabama, because we believe that when Caesar and our blessed Savior collide, the nod goes to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What would happen on the mall? There's only one preacher on the mall, and he stands tall. Martin Luther King Jr. Think of the value to the Seventh-day Adventist Church if the one preacher on the mall was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. Think of what that would mean. Think of what it would have meant if the Seventh-day Adventist Church had had a prophetic word at a time when people needed to hear. Think of what would have happened had it been a Seventh-day Adventist pastor on the mall in 1963 saying now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valleys of segregation to the sunlit paths of racial justice. Now is the time to open the doors of opportunity for all of God's children. Show me the currency of your spirituality. And even if it's legal if it is against what my blessed Savior taught. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Beloved, we can do this. Now, I want to challenge you to do something. Senator Langford of Oklahoma and Senator Scott, African-American from South Carolina, have something they call Solution Sunday. Baby step. Martin Luther King said, <laughs> Sunday morning divine worship is one of the most segregated hours of the week. I can be said for Sabbath worship as well in many places. And so the two senators propose, invite someone who is different from you, racial difference, home for dinner. The reality is most of us have never invited, most people have never invited someone who does not look like them home for dinner. That, just that baby step, that connection, praise God. I want to challenge you. If you have never done that, to make a commitment to God today, I'm going to reach out to someone who is different from me. It is time for America to come together. Demonic forces are at work. We're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. But I know somebody who can bring us together. I know somebody who can unite us. I know somebody who loves us so much, he wants what is best for us who is so wise, he knows what is best for us, and who is so powerful that he can bring about what is best for us. And his last cry to the Father before he ascended was, make them one. Make them one as we are one. So show me the currency 
of your love for my lover, my lover, the great lover of my soul. Show me, show me, show me the money. God bless you and keep you is my prayer. Let's pray, pray as we close. I know you're going to want to, uh, probably a lot of you are going to want to stay for the next service, but there's also going to be some folks who are going to want to get in here for the next service. So know that we do, we are streaming this live and you might have time to get home if you've been here this one and you want to leave room uh, for someone else, but certainly you are free to choose as you see fit. Thank you so much for your powerful words today and we look forward to the words to come. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, it's a powerful challenge to us uh, to love beyond our inherent bias. But you had every reason to be biased against us because we are sinners, yet Jesus came to us. And even when we did not treat him as he deserved, yet he died for us to open the way and make it real. So, Lord, I pray that each of our hearts will be touched by this message and we will not hang on to the piece of it that we agree with, but that we will embrace it in full and allow your word, your scripture, not to answer our questions, but to question all of our answers and make us one. Even when... We might not even agree. Your grace can do that. May our love for each other in Christ be stronger than anything else. In Jesus' name, amen.